Where uh, where are you? Are you at home? I'm at home in Portland. How's Portland? Uh, I like it. <laughs> you know, I spend a lot of time up in Seattle too, but uh, I prefer to live in Portland. I guess that, you know, as, as, a, as a woolly liberal, of which, you know, I am very much a woolly liberal, I always used to look at Portland with a, a great deal of, uh, I don't know, it almost, it almost seemed like it's sort of liberal mecca to me, but I just hear reports that it's always on fire. Is that is that media spin or is that what it's like? That's media spin. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of forests near us and uh, the last few years have seen some really awful fires. Uh, that first year of the pandemic, it was it was unbelievable how smoky it was here for a while. It really was like the end of days. Right. Okay. But it's, but it's kind it, of it's okay at the moment. It was nice and rainy the last couple of days, and yeah. All right. So let's jump into the book. So how did sure. the book how did the book come about? Um, my uh, co writer Adam uh, Tepetalin, uh contacted me and suggested we try to do something. Um, I'd known him vaguely. He, he had been a journalist in Seattle for years and was the editor of the local free weekly magazine, The Rocket. And, uh, you know, uh, it was early on in the pandemic and I wasn't doing anything else. And we thought about it and talked about it and kind of started doing Zoom meetings and sort of outlining what, you know, I would hope a book like this to be about, you know, I, you know, I wanted to focus on the times in Seattle before the media arrived, uh, the, you know, the early punk and hardcore scenes that kind of, uh, coalesced into what became known as grunge. I mean, when you, when you, I mean, cause the book's sort of in three parts really, isn't it? Yeah. When, when do you, cause you know, I'm a, I'm a teenager that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a, a story which is um, unlike many people my age, I don't think. But I hear never mind, and then I work backwards, and then right. I, <laughs> you know, dis discover sub pop and K, and mm -hmm. you know, realize that there's a road to where I've entered. When did you feel like Seattle became what you're talking about? When, when did you feel like the media turned up? I mean, when you say media, do you mean, yeah, I mean, do you mean Everett True, or do you mean almost <laughs> like what follows after that? Uh, well, he's definitely a part of it, you know. Uh, um, now, I, I, you know, we were ignored until Sub Pop showed up, basically. And when Jonathan and Bruce partnered up and really tried to focus on the Seattle scene, uh, there was that minor impact that also involved Everett showing up and doing that big article. And uh, But it was already starting to kind of gain steam a little bit. Uh, you know, we started going on tour right away in 1988, basically. And, uh, you know, Sonic Youth got involved and that was a big deal. And so it seems like 1989, there was this uh, international notice of what was happening in Seattle. And it was starting to get a little bit bigger. And, you know, kind of it did that for a while. So Soundgarden was starting to do pretty well, but they were they were sort of being marketed as a metal band at that point. It didn't really, uh, there wasn't really an angle to market them as a band from Seattle necessarily yet. And, uh, you know, it really was, you know, when Nirvana released Nevermind and then Pearl Jam did 10, those were, that was a pretty huge explosion. That was the big one, but there was that minor one already that had happened earlier. And, uh, you know, obviously it got more and more ridiculous through 92 and 93 <laughs> where when's like what's what's peak ridiculous though i mean because the you know there obviously is like a tragedy which i guess the narrative is that that's the end of the line really but yeah when's, when's the moment you're like this is so far away from where all of this started i think a lot of what was going on in 92 was i guess the, the mainstream media just descending upon Seattle and asking the most ridiculous questions. Uh, Megan from Sub Pop's uh, New York Times article where she made up all the terms uh, for the grunge lexicon. That was pretty peak, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that was pretty great. That was a, a genius move on her part. 
yeah. but that's just typical her. She's hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think seeing Eddie Vedder on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, I walked into my corner store to get a six pack of beer or something, and there, there's old Ed on the cover of Time. I'm like, what is going on? Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot of that. Those kind of peaks. I mean, um, obviously you, uh, you, you know, you're in Green River for a time. I mean, yeah. given given that that band, I mean, I know you left before the end of that band, but given that that, I mean, that doesn't sound like it was the greatest of experiences for you in places. Like, did that not maybe derail? Did that make you think twice about starting another band? Uh, well, I, you know, music for me was never a career kind of goal. Uh, Green River started out one thing, and it it changed, and I wasn't happy with it and I wasn't helping them achieve anything that they wanted to do. So I got out of there. Uh, you know, I say over and over, they got way better after I left. Bruce was the right guy for the job at the time and dry as a bone is their best record. Uh, you know, I think, you know, they got good and then rehab doll was less good to me. <laughs> and you could, t you could tell by that point, there was kind of a, a bit of a struggle going between Mark and the rest of the band. And uh, so once that split up, there was never any question that me and Mark would do another band. Right. You know, the day the day they split, Mark called me. I was like, okay, I guess I'm coming back to Seattle. You know, um, it just seemed we 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 were hanging out a lot and really fueling each other's interest in the kind of music that we wanted to do. So, uh, you know, it. Yeah, I, I, I. It's not like I vowed I'd never be in a band again, but. Uh, I wasn't sure if I would be after I quit Green River. It's weird, you know, because, you know, I guess for me being a, a teenager on this side of the ocean and, you know, grunge for want of a better term or alternative rock sort of changing my changing my life. But I've also been involved in music scenes as well and, and realised that, like, sometimes how these things are reported aren't, don't really reflect the reality of how they actually were. I mean, it's like... Green River are viewed as this, uh, well, kind of like, well, a legendary band, really, that, you know, in that they were almost kind of year zero in many ways. Is that how yeah. it felt at the time, or is that just how history has is, history is retold that happening? Yeah, no, it didn't feel like anything that big of a deal, really. Uh, you know, it was exciting when we actually got a record out on Homestead Records Yeah, uh, in 1985, right? And, uh, you know, you could tell there was something happening in Seattle. The U-Men had a record on Homestead at that point, too. And, you know, there was... We thought it was a really great scene that was happening there. Uh, with, you know, we had the Melvins, we had Malfunction, we had Soundgarden, Skin Yard. Uh, did I say Feast already? I can't remember. No. But you haven't. But they, yeah, there was a lot going on that was pretty interesting, and there was a pretty close, tight-knit scene. So, to me, I felt like there was something happening but not necessarily one particular band because like it seemed like there was this scene that was coming out of the hardcore and punk scenes that were morphing into something else but that also was happening across the country and you know i suppose the world really but the underground american scene at that point was pretty interesting to me and there's a lot of really cool stuff happening we had touch and go records out of chicago that was doing great stuff butthole surfers big black um kill dozer there was a lot of Sonic Youth, obviously, in the that would be the late stages of SST records in my mind, where there's all sorts of weird records coming out there. Uh, yeah, everyone was trying to figure out what to do after hardcore. Is the way I always kind of view the the bigger picture of the American underground, and some people going metal. You know, the crossover metal thing was happening with DRI and corrosion of conformity. There was a lot going on. It didn't it didn't seem like just Seattle, but I knew that Seattle had a pretty cool thing that was slightly unique. And you know, a little bit hairier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like you've mentioned Mark. You know, you've mentioned Mark, obviously, because like, you know, what you've done musically is so interwoven the two of you. But yeah, I've, ne I've never met Mark Arm, but it, it does seem like you are very different people in terms of just how you've lived your life. Like, I guess what I'm sort of almost like alluding to there really is that was was there ever anyone within Mud Honey that wanted the that wanted to almost follow the route of Eddie Vedder or a Kurt Cobain or, you know, that was, 
more inclined to be a rock star? Not really. Mark is a fairly reserved person. Uh, you it's might not of, know. Kind, I've heard this, but it's kind of weird when you see him play, and you're like, mm, I, yeah. that, that doesn't sync with me." Yeah, he channels he channels something else, you know, for on stage, and he works really hard at his music, you know. But he's a very reserved uh, person, and you know, I mean, everyone changes slowly as you go through life. But you know, he is 61 years old, and you know, he's he's quite happy in his life. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's not a tortured artist in any sense, I don't think. Um, you know, we, when, you know, we've been around a long time. So people have started to, you know, we have a book written about us. We had a documentary made about us. And that involves some kind of looking back a little bit. And the arc of Mudhoney is kind of a weird straight line. We don't have much, like when the Tad movie came out, like they had a quite a, a dramatic arc to their story. Lots of troubles and pitfalls and all sorts of stuff. And our our thing, we just kind of keep going. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that's wild to me, really, is that, I mean, you know, as a journalist, I'm so interested in narratives and spin right. and, you know, like there's almost a reading of Mudhoney of like, Oh, they never, you know, they never broke like some of their peers. But then the the flip of that is, well, no one's dead, and yes. they are still making music, and the music's never dipped. You know, it's almost like, in a weird way, you guys kind of, this is such a gross way of putting it, but you guys are kind of the winners in a way. <laughs> well, you know, uh, like I said, we just kind of keep going and we do what we do. and But that's kind of how we viewed it in the midst of the giant explosion of 92, if you will, you know, 90, late 91, all of 92, we'd already been around for a few years. So we already had our things set up. We knew who we were and how we liked to do things and what we were comfortable with. When people say that, uh, you know, we've had this question since Nevermind came out basically like, so you guys feel like you should be big stars too. And we're always like, have you heard our records? Like, no, <laughs> like, like, listen to our records. Like why, what about that makes you think it should be in the top 40? <laughs> well, yeah, no. So, I mean, I've got, I've got friends that are in sort of quite experimental indie rock bands that briefly had a mo had moments of right. stardom, you know, and, and almost have sort of mourned the passing of that. And I always say to them, look, it was a, it was a freak incident right. that you got that moment in the sun right but i guess you know you saying that at the same time you know when sonic youth have got records out on you know geffen and they're getting on rotation on tv yeah weird, weird things happen like sure. there, there, there is a world where mud honey could have been quote unquote bigger yeah i mean we could have hit we could have had a fluke video hit or something like that but it would have been a fluke in in any if it had happened, it would have been some kind of weird fluke, and it wouldn't have lasted long for us either. Yeah, you know, we got way further than we ever thought we would. We're still doing better than we thought we would. <laughs> you know, strangely enough, you know, we're thankful that people still come out and see us, and you know, our new record, like, people seem to be paying a little bit more attention to it than than some of our records. Uh, you know, the the weird thing is, it seems almost like you have to put out a record to go on tour in order to get press to promote the tour. Cause that's the only place bands like us make any money. You know, we don't make money from record sales or anything like that. Yeah. And yeah. we don't tour that much because we, the way we not designed our lives, but the way our lives turned out is that three of us had kids and we've all had jobs. And so we've had to juggle a lot of other, you know, adult responsibilities. No, no big deal really. But, uh, you know, we we tour a couple months out of the year tops. So, yeah. When was the when was the last time you were in the UK? I saw I saw you at Electric Ballroom, which feels like it was last year, but it was probably five years ago. Time well, we were there out. last uh, October, maybe. Right. I mean, so I think I saw you the time before that. I, I remember okay. to your press person over here telling me you were here, and yeah, we, we did we did a whole European tour last fall. And because, uh, I mean, we, we'd had it rescheduled and canceled twice before that because of the pandemic, of course. But we were there just a few months before the pandemic started. We were there, I think, in November of 2019. So that might have been the time that you saw us. 
Oh, maybe it was, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, probably make, God, that's ages ago. Time's gone so weird, man. Yeah, uh, that, that, there's been a complete break in the time uh, space, <laughs> time continuum. space continuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he's like, I don't know. Like, that seems like it's hard. I can't tell because it's like there's two years that just didn't really happen. Yeah, totally. But they also felt like a decade as well. Right. With um, I, I, the other thing, I guess, from the outside looking in, I mean, the, there's so much of Seattle. Seattle's story, which is like synonymous with drugs, you have, you know, you've said like you have so little interest in drugs. Did you? How did that feel? Like, did that? Did you feel like, uh, like an outsider in a sense? No, most people weren't doing hard drugs. Um, that that's a fairly small world, and it's all over the music world, especially in the underground. I mean, we were playing shows with the Laughing Hyenas in 1988. You want to talk about drugs? <laughs> talk, right. talk to John Brennan. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, so yeah, you know, I I wasn't in that world, so a lot of what those people were up to was completely out of my sight because I guess wasn't hanging out at their apartments because they were just hanging out at their apartments doing drugs. I mean, you know, um, I went to, I went to see um, Keith Cameron do a talk about his mud, mud honey book not that yeah. long ago, and he was talking about drugs and he was saying about you and like how when Mark took drugs, it was almost like a very private thing that you weren't really aware of. Is that is that right? Well, I was pretty naive about it because I it wasn't part of my world. I mean, he started tinkering around with hard drugs when he was in Green River. Yeah, and. You know, I remember people telling me about it and said, like, you need to talk to Mark. I was like, what am I supposed to say? I don't know anything about drugs. And, you know, he's an adult. You know, if he wants to play around with drugs, I mean, I'm, personal freedom, I'm all for it. Um, you know, he he got in too deep and, you know, he's kind of embarrassed by it, but also willing to talk about it at the same time, you know. Um, you know, he he's said that he felt like he became a cliche. You know, he was a drug addicted rock and roll singer dating a stripper <laughs> and that's not where he, how he saw himself <laughs> yeah 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 i mean you know we personal growth and all that yeah yeah and he he got through it and he learned and he uh i think he's got a very realistic point of view on drugs at this point you know he's not a he didn't do the 12 step thing which is great for people that do that Mark sorted it out himself and he hasn't shied away from the fact that people do drugs because drugs are fun and then they're not fun. That, that's kind of how that trip goes. You know, I mean, I've smoked marijuana. Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've had some penicillin. It's, it's fine. <laughs> um, I, I like the bit in the book where you're talking about almost like the difference between the Nirvana and Pearl Jam camps. And I guess that like, you know, me, the righteous, the righteous 16-year-old that I was, you know, it took me a while really to have an appreciation of Pearl Jam just because I had an idea of what they were. Sure. Like, but you you almost describe Pearl Jam as like this healthy, functioning family and that mm -hmm. not being the case with Nirvana. Is, is that how it was? Well, from my point of view, yeah. Uh, I think all of Mudhoney, we all were in agreement with. We were surprised at how chaotic that tour was once they had reached that level of success. And we were also then surprised on the flip side of how organized and happy everybody was in the Pearl Jam camp. And that remains to this day. I mean, some of the Pearl Jam's crew that we met in 1993 are still working for Pearl Jam. I mean, that says yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, totally. um, and th there was that whole, like, divide of, like, who's more punk rock, you know, Nirvana or Pearl Jam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Jeff Amitt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I went to in, yeah, yeah, I went to interview uh, I went to interview Pearl Jam for the NME uh, in my mid twenties, and we went to the, their warehouse, and I interviewed all the bands. Seattle, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. I had about a week in Seattle, and oh, cool. uh, yeah, it was amazing. And I, I did I did all of the nerdy shit. I did all Cro Crocodile Cafe. That's right. Yeah. Like I just sort of went all these places that I'd heard about when I was growing up, but when I interviewed Pearl Jam, uh, even though they were talking about their their big record, Jeff Ament comes running out as we're about to leave, and he's got a demo of his 
hardcore band that he's doing in his spare time and i was like oh it sort of says a lot really i i instantly liked him for that yeah i mean he was a small town punk rock hardcore kid skateboarder had a ramp had a band had a fanzine you know deranged diction was did he send, did he give you the deranged diction tape or did he was he was it some other side project he was doing no i think it was deranged diction yeah, yeah. that was his uh, 80s band that moved out to seattle from montana that uh they they did i think they did some reunion shows at some point uh but yeah they were just straight up hardcore you know that's amazing yeah. did you um because I guess, I guess the thing is as well is I've, I've often thought about the nature of like what punk rock is i mean it's just such a it's such a broad term at this point and unites sure. so many different things i mean you know like really what do fugazi have in common with i don't know the the uk subs right it's it's a different thing but i guess that there is that sort of american take on punk rock which is very much about just trying to do things in a different way and a lot of it is about work ethic yeah um, it, i mean that's really what you subscribe to right yeah and I, I think you know we we all learned from black flag yeah you know their music changed but their point of view i guess didn't you know and i mean they were a very hard working band yeah, it's, it's weird with Black Flag, though, because there is a sort of... Ni well, there is I'm not a sort of... There is a nihilism to Black Flag as well, though. So there, yeah. is, there is that degree of... They, they they are a broad church in like what they represent. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I've been digging the uh, process of weeding out LP lately, their instrumental record. Oh, it's amazing. That is one weird record. <laughs> it's, ama it's, it's amazing, man. I mean, I know we were talking briefly about Smoking Pot, but that's a pot record. Oh, yeah. Greg Ginn was smoking a lot of pot at that point. That's when he started that band Gone as well. Yeah. yeah and they, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, I saw Gone play outside of a skateboard shop, you know, punk record store slash skateboard shop, Fallout Records in Seattle. Like they just played on the sidewalk in front. It was one of the coolest things I've seen, I think. Oh, it was just out there, you know, but really great stuff. Cause like, at that, that was 1985 or 86. So Black Flag. They'd changed too, mem too many members by that point. The, the 1986 Black Flag didn't work for me. Right. But the Gone thing in 86 definitely worked for me. I mean, it's the first part of the book where you're basically discovering discovering punk and hardcore and it's shaping you. I mean, that's... Yeah. I really... I, I love that bit of the book. And it, in a weird way, it's like... Because I knew what was coming up, there's part of me going, oh, for fuck's sake, Steve, get on with it, man. But then at the same time... <laughs> At the same time, it did capture that it it captured such a spirit of what I love about this stuff that yeah I, I only I only said for fuck's sake Steve or under my breath you know it wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> well that, that's what I was trying to like you know get back into teenage Steve's mind and describe what was happening in Seattle because I you know there was a lot of great music happening in Seattle way before anybody cared about what was happening in Seattle yeah yeah. I mean, do, there's the bit kind of after, after it sort of hits its peak, and then there's there's an end. There's an end. There is a little window where, well, there's a little window I feel like before Modern E get almost rediscovered. Like, is that how it felt for you? Like, yeah, I, I guess the kind of late the, the late nineties. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there was a, it, sorry. There was a, a kind of a doldrums era right there, where. And I totally understood it. In 1995, when we did My Brother the Cow, people were just kind of in shock and at at Kurt's death and the tragedies that were starting to mount up, I guess, with other, you know, people dying. Uh, and, you know, it was an interesting time in Seattle because there was, we had the presence of the United States of America and uh, why do I always forget the name of the band that had fence pole sitter? They had what? It, there was that big hit, Fence Pole Sitter. What was the name of the band? I always forget their name, which... I, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, well, anyway, there was a very sunshiny, happy pop songs were coming out of Seattle now with the Presidents and... Uh, God damn it. The other band. And, yeah. and I thought that was... It, it made sense. It was kind of a reaction to, I guess, like the doom and gloom that was, that was so associated with Seattle at that point. Um but yeah, I mean, we couldn't get arrested in England in the late 90s. Yeah. It, it took, I mean, we, our records would get good reviews because we had Keith Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
but you know the shows were shrinking and it was obvious in 1998 that you know Lucan was kind of tired of doing it and the record label knew that they weren't going to get anywhere with us. You know, it's felt like things were kind of coming to some sort of end, not necessarily the band, but uh, an era was coming to an end. It was, it was over. And it, you know, Matt quit. We got dropped from Warners. We did a best of on sub pop and then we got guy and started putting out records again. And it seemed like as soon as, we sort of came back, if you will, uh, things started going on the upswing again. And there was, I mean, it's definitely a nostalgic thing. We, we'd always have what we called the sad Cobains up front at the shows. There'd always be some kid, teenager dressed like Kurt Cobain. What did like, you actually the, call them the sad Cobains? We, we called them the sad Cobains. <laughs> there was always one that's like, it always looks forlorn. Like, Dude, <laughs> lighten up, man. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, he was. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. I I worked for a guy once in a music magazine, and we were talking about the um, we were talking about the Manic Street Preachers, who were a band I don't really think really mean anything in America, but they didn't get anywhere here. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. They, they you know, they were they're almost a sort of like a almost like sort of like Guns N' Roses if they were Marxist, you know, like yeah. which is funny. But they, they were, I loved them as a kid. And you know, the, all their they had a guitarist who went missing, and he's never. Yeah, yeah. He's never I, I know the story. Yeah, yeah. And I remember talking to this guy who would interviewed him loads of times, and he was saying, he was saying it's so sad that the that he's sort of become this gaunt kind of martyr in a way when he mm. was just so fucking funny. I mean, I guess that's the thing a little bit with you know when I've watched like there's that Nirvana. Uh, DVD that I wore to bits as a, as a kid, the Life, Life Tonight sold out, and mm-hmm. for a good proportion of that, I'm like, Kirk Main's a really fucking funny dude. Yeah, like, yeah. W- was that what he was like? Um, he was he was shy. I, you know, I I did not know him real well. We did lots of shows together, but the two of us didn't seem to have much to talk about with each other. It was just one of those, like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, good to see you, man. And then kind of awkward silence. Which, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just the way some relationships are, I guess. Uh, you know, I, th- I think we had, you know, great respect for each other and that kind of thing and liked each other's bands, but didn't have a lot to talk about. Um, especially in the later days, because he was clearly struggling with his personal issues and stuff. Um, you know, and I had no help <laughs> for, for that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, I wasn't yeah. that kind of friend to him. So, uh, you know, it was just sad. I mean, I, the last time I saw him, he was just walking down the street by himself. It looked like he he was walking from his home. And it, it seemed, I remember at the time, because like I knew he had been ditching out of rehabs and stuff. I'm like, I wonder if he's on the, if he's on the run right now. But I didn't yeah. stop and, you know, say hi to him. I was in my car. Yeah, I, I guess the broader question really is that, I, I suppose it's that thing of he's sort of syn- synonymous with this idea that, Seattle was this place of great pain and suffering and they all came out in the music and that's not how it was, right? No, but I I think, you know, you can separate the art from the people and everybody's got all sorts of different parts of themselves, right? Like one of my favorite singer songwriters, Towns Van Zandt, his songs were bleak, quite a few of them, but he was ridiculously funny. Yeah as well yeah you know uh, i think i think that's just a a good you know balance in humanity yeah absolutely there's dark humor there's light humor you know there's pathos there's all sorts of stuff going on has anyone ever told you steve that you come across as a very likable and uh and and reasoned man oh fuck you <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a good place to end it actually. Where are uh, where what 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 mud honey what are mud honey doing? Are you writing songs or have you got No, we you know we just got that record out and and uh um we have a US tour in the fall. Okay. Uh you know guy moved back to Australia so that's a little further wrinkle at the moment. But it's actually making touring work out fairly well because we have to get together and actually rehearse for like a week before the tour starts. Cause we haven't just been regularly getting together. So we end up being in really good shape as soon as the tour starts. 
So the oh, touring thing is going to be, it seems to be working. We're planning on doing one month every six months. Oh, and, nice. uh, so we actually, we're more organized right now than usual. We have, we have a schedule and, uh, you know, uh, writing another record presents its own challenges now with guy on the other side of the planet, but we'll figure it out. Well, listen, when you do get to the UK, I, I won't go down the front because uh, I don't think I can pull off a sad Cobain. But, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be somewhere in the middle, probably closer to the bar, I'm 42 yeah. after all, you know. So. Well, well, keep your eye out. and I know you'll see a sad Cobain there. <laughs> I'm going to do, do that. <laughs> listen, Steve, I'm so pleased we per persevered. Thanks loads yeah. for your time, man. Yeah, thank you.